Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm here with Dr. Sarah Hill. She is Associate Professor of Psychology at Texas Christian University. She studies a range of topics applying an evolutionary lens, including the interplay between immune function and mating strategies, the impact of inflammation, poverty, food regulation, and weight gain, hormonal contraceptives and mate choice, and other topics under the rubric of life history theory. So Dr. Hill, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's really a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, thank you. Okay, so let's get started off with this. Uh, what is life history theory? I mean, I've already interviewed a couple of people with whom I briefly talked about this issue, particularly Dr. Steven Neuberg and also a couple of primatologists like uh, Franz Duval and Peter Kepler. But and anyway, I, I would like to have a proper definition of it. Yeah, it's a theory about the different types of um, developmental and behavioral trade-offs that um, organisms make to help like sort of match their phenotype uh, to their environment. And so it's just this idea that organisms will make different types of developmental trade-offs and have different life course pathways depending on, um, you know, things like that influence their the availability of resources and um, the mortality rate and other things like that. And so it's, it's, a, it's a theory about resource allocation. Mm -hmm. Yes, but, but I mean, th there's two sides to it, right? Because I mean, uh, on the one hand, uh, each species tends to have a life history of itself, that is the several stages uh, the individuals have to go through until they reach adulthood, right? Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, so they, they have, let's say, a general life history theory, but then according to the environmental conditions they are exposed to, uh, the, the span of time that each stage uh, the, uh, the, that the span of time that they take to go through each stage might change, right? Right, yeah. So life history theory, theory was originally developed as a means of understanding the different sort of life paths that different species took. So, for example, you know, we can use this theoretical framework to understand um, the differences in developmental timing and reproductive strategies and parental investment that, for example, guppies make compared to human beings, right? And the idea is that um, each species has sort of evolved its own life life history sort of pathway that helps um, sort of promote survival and reproduction based on its local ecological conditions. But um, since, you know, the time that this theory was originally developed um, to understand these um, between species differences, it's since been apply applied to understand um, developmental fine tuning that goes on within an individual species. And so, for example, with respect to humans, um, what we tend to find is that um, a person's early life environment influences the types of developmental trade-offs. So even though humans have this sort of um, slower life history strategy, just in terms of the fact that we have a long lifespan, so we spend a t we tend to spend a lot of time um, developing and maturing and building up somatic and um, sort of embodied capital before we begin to reproduce. Um, and then we tend to invest heavily in our offspring and all of those types of things that humans tend to do. Um, that we also sort of fine tune our um, our strategy based on our ecological conditions, and so within individual humans, we should expect to see developmental adjustments um, to help um, best promote survival and reproduction, given the specifics of their human ecology. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in our case, the Homo sapiens, what are the stages we go through generally in our life history? Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of the trade-offs that we tend to look at when we're looking at life history strategies um, tend to be things like at what point does an individual sort of move um, from in, in, uh, investing in their own physiological development um, and start uh, sort of investing in reproduction? That's sort of a big switch that individuals make where they're um, investing in their own growth and their development. And then, um, you know, then when is it time to start reproducing? And so that influences things like the timing of um, puberty, 
um, and sexual maturation because the more time you spend developing, the later you're going to go into puberty and then the later you're going to be, um, you know, presumably reproducing. And that's, and that's generally what you tend to find. So that's one of the big switches. Another um, switch is about like how much um, you're sort of investing in your offspring, right? And so like, are you going to be investing a lot in um, reproduction and having uh, you know several children and then investing relatively less in each, or are you going to be investing in um, you know uh, fewer offspring um, or, or investing heavily in fewer offspring? And um, you know another thing that and that nobody's really looked at this because humans are kind of unique in this way is just the um, there's also sort of a switch that goes um, from you know, like with uh, grandparenting and, you know, there's been some kind of cool research um, in humans on menopause and like the grandparenting hypotheses. Um, and I, presumably there's some sort of another switch point at which it makes sense that parents start, um, you know, investing in grandchildren. But like the big switch is really that when do you stop investing in your own body and start investing in the bodies of other people? And that's the sort of reproductive timing question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are those aspects of hello parenting and perhaps the role that it played during our evolutionary history because I mean, we as humans when we are born we are pretty useless and we have yeah. a long period of dependency and so it might have been important to have uh, apart from our parents also our grandparents participating in it. Uh, and so, uh, and I mean, it is already very long in comparison with other species, but even nowadays it seems to be longer and there are people who only reach puberty at 40 or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in terms, of, in terms of when they're leaving the house, definitely. Yeah, it really is interesting because you see that there's sort of a parental investment arms race that goes on where it's like children are sort of delaying the launching point from, you know, like sort of siphoning resources from their parents to generating their own resources until later and later and later and later. And it, in part, it's because the, like the, you know, getting an education and doing a lot of these other things that make offspring competitive to be able to acquire resources has become so much more competitive. And so it's like this arms race of competition to get access to the resources, which um, sort of prolongs the developmental pathway, you know, yeah, until parents, until kids are in their 40s and living at their parents' house. <laughs> yeah, right, living in their mom's basement or something yeah, like that. That's, yeah, that's always the joke in my lab is, um, is yeah, living in mom's basement and playing video games. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's, it's sad, it's sad, particularly for men because it happens much more with men and perhaps we can get at that. But what are the earliest uh, period in people's lives where it is already reliable to study the impact impact of some environmental cues or environmental aspects that might have some long-term consequences in terms of how their life history will develop? Let's yeah, see. so um, it's likely um, something that happens as early as the uterine environment. So a lot of the research um, that's been done in humans in terms of developmental fine-tuning has focused on the early life environment, usually between the ages, like when a child is born up until age six. But I mean, there's research, you know, like the Barker hypothesis or the thrifty phenotype hypothesis that, you know, has, has been around for uh, like 30 years now. And, um, you know, what these researchers found was that, um, you know, babies who are born to mothers who are deprived of resources, um, you know, during pregnancy, that those children are, are already sort of, you know, prenatally pre-programmed to have a thrifty phenotype and to have a slower rate of metabolism, you know, and um, be more prone to things like insulin resistance and these types of developmental changes that would, you know, facilitate survival in resource um, scarce or unpredictable ecological conditions, but would, you know, obviously they promote obesity in our currently really food rich environment. So um, even though most of the research is focused on the early home life environment, I'm I'm willing to bet that if we start to back this up and once we're able to run more research where we actually test these models on animals, because, you know, you can deprive a, a, a mom, you know, a pregnant rat resources and then see what happens with their offspring. You can't do that with people. Um, but I think once we, um, once the, as the field matures, I think that we're going to begin to see the sort of period of exposure um, and the critical periods of exposure sort of moving backward to the time of pregnancy. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, I mean, but those things, even what happens prenatally, those are not really deterministic, right? So let's say that, for example, when the fetus is developing, it is exposed to uh, cues or signals that perhaps uh, the environment doesn't have many resources and so it, it gets prepared to uh, a fast life history theory, I guess. But then uh, let's imagine that that person is born and, and they get exposed to an environment of, uh, that is a plentiful environment. So perhaps mm -hmm. with new cues, the life history could develop in the opposite direction or, or not? Right, well, maybe, maybe not, because there are some, I mean, well, it's, 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 there's sort of a lot of questions you asked at once. So it, nothing is deterministic, right? And like part of um, what is, is sort of a big push for research in this area is trying to understand resiliency, right? And so what is the secret sauce that makes some people less vulnerable to these types of, you know, these types of negative phenotypic programming effects that might be going on either in the uterine environment or the early life environment because you're right to identify the fact that not everybody is equally vulnerable. Not everybody's going to experience these types of developmental changes based on those cues. Um, but, you know, just if you have, a, for example, with the Barker hypothesis or the thrifty phenotype hypothesis, what these researchers find is that when children are getting these cues prenatally, that suggests that resources are scarce, um, once they come out into the world, um, they tend to put on weight very quickly. And um, when you actually mismatch the environment, when you have like resource scarcity in the uterine environment, and then there's an abundance of calories in their early life environment, this actually can promote unhealthy weight gain and, um, and some of these sort of more negative effects. And so, you know, it, it depends. You know, in the case of the, um, the metabolic questions, um, you know, I think that it could exacerbate the situation. Now, in other cases, for example, if you have a uterine environment that's very stressful, so mom's HPA axis is regularly being engaged because of, um, because of stress, you know, there's a, there's a chance that the child could sort of start to become you know, sort of sensitized to um, uh, glucocorticoid signaling in ways that might influence the development of the HPA axis. But being in an early life environment that that's then calm and serene, I mean, I would assume that the effect of the um, environments would be cumulative, meaning that, you know, if things got better, that, that, that things would develop in ways that were sort of more you know, like in the ways that we would expect from a child from a from a sort of safe and predictable, unstressful environment. But but those early effects, I think, would you know, it's you, you don't go untouched by your environment, you know. Um, and so I think that it would still have an impact, but it would differ based on the sort of accumulation of of stress over time. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, oh boy, I just asked you that because I was hopeful that you would give me an answer that would uh, allow me to put out, put, there, uh, put outside that uh, if people were just to cut their 40-year-old mom's basement game playing child uh, to, to cut his access to food, perhaps he would then go look for a job or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but uh, oh, but uh, I, I guess it's more complicated than that. Anyway, anyway, what what are perhaps some of the main things that people evaluate? Of course, probably these doesn't go; they don't consciously evaluate these things. But what are some of the aspects of the environment that people compute in order for them to follow a fast or a slow life history strategy? Yeah, so in the in a person's early life environment, so the research that's been done looking at the effects of like the childhood ecological conditions, um, sort of the big drivers seem to be um, the dimensions of harshness and then unpredictability. And so just to briefly like explain what that means, harshness gets at the um, degree to which an environment is sort of lacking or abundant of the resources that are necessary for life. So things like food and you know, um, clean water and that sort of thing. Um, and so that's like the harshness dimension. And then the unpredictability piece is exactly what it sounds like. It's just unpredictability. Um, and are you able to predict, are you able to use what happened before to predict what's going to happen next? 
And in terms of influencing, um, you know, in, in sort of developmental outcomes, the unpredictability aspect of it seems to be the thing that really um, sort of shifts um, strategies toward, you know, um, like a faster life history strategy. And this is unpredictability sort of broadly speaking. So like when you look at um, some of the research that, uh, that we've been doing, um, you know, we find that um, unpredictability just in terms of the amount of chaos that's in a child's early life environment, unpredictability in parenting practices. So um, if they feel like their parents aren't reliable and trustworthy, um, that's really a big sort of piece to the um, sort of unpredictability dimension, but also unpredictability in terms of um, things like uh, the mortality rate. So if there's a high rate of violent crime, or if you're in a place, you know, if you live in a country that is, there's a lot of political turmoil and things are changing very quickly and you don't know if your family's going to be okay or not okay, these are the types of um, environmental cues, things that, you know, can have an impact on um, survival, essentially, um, are the things that tend to really play an important role in shaping um, life histories. Mm -hmm. But uh, another thing that perhaps goes into the equation here uh, is related to uh, individual variability, perhaps in terms of uh, personality traits or other psychological traits, right? Because, I mean, uh, it's not true that all people respond to the same environmental cues in the same way, right? Right. No, exactly. I mean, and, and what's really, and like I said, that like one of the sort of big pushes in understanding, um, you know, like what this all means for the world that we live in, um, there's been a lot of research in, you know, quote unquote resiliency, right? So like resilience, like what is it that makes children um, resilient to bad environments? Because if we can figure that out, then hopefully we can package it Right. And um, and then give it to everybody who wants it. So that way, um, you know, we can um, protect vulnerable, you know, like especially children from um, environments that might sort of send them down this negative developmental pathway. And if, um, and if I knew what the answer was, I would be rich <laughs> and also famous. Um, and I don't have the answer, but there's a lot of research into that. Like everybody wants to know what the, you know, what is the secret sauce? Like what makes a, what makes somebody um, immune to the negative effects of their environment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, it's very frustrating because my show is basically about interviewing scientists, and no one has any answer to anything. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, scientists have more questions than answers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I guess that's the interesting part of it. Okay, yeah. so let's get into more specific topics now. So in your work, you also talk a lot about immune function and how it might impact some decisions that people make in terms of their life history and things like that. And, and particularly in this case, their mating strategy. So I've already talked a lot with several other guests about the emotion of disgust and the behavioral immune system. So does it have anything to do with it? Not really, no. So the, um, you know, what we're really interested in is, I mean, the immune system, we, we actually have some kind of cool work going on right now looking at the interplay between the immune system and disgust, but it's not really relevant necessarily to um, life history theory. So I'll like save you the discussion on that. Um, but, uh, you know, what we're really interested in is um, vulnerability to um, sort of like really like sort of serious um, li lifespan impacting um, illnesses and disease on um, influencing a person's uh, mating strategies and then also um, their desire for immediate versus delayed gratification. And so, you know, one of the um, things that we know, just to talk about the mating um, psychology stuff first, um, one thing that we know about sexual reproduction is that um, one of the primary reasons that it originated as a means of gene transmission and the reason that it's maintained as a means of gene trans transmission for, you know, the majority of living organisms on the planet 
um, is because it's so good at generating variability. And variability is something that's um, really good in terms of promoting the long-term survivability of your genes, right? Because when you, ha when you have variability, when you're putting your eggs in lots of different types of baskets, that increases the likelihood that any one of those investments is going to pay off, especially if the environment is changing rapidly and you don't know what to, exp you know, what is going to be the um, sort of genetic combination that's going to promote survival, you know, into the future. And so, um, you know, so sexual reproduction is brilliant that way. And that's why it's um, been maintained for, you know, as a means of gene transmission for so many different species. And one of the biggest things that it provides a benefit to um, is rapidly evolving pathogens and parasites sites and so on and so forth. And the idea is, you know, these guys who feast on us um, have a very short lifespan. And so their, their pace of evolution is just like this because they're constantly reproducing and generating variability. And so selection acts very rapidly on these guys. Um, and so they can quickly learn to specialize in any individual genome. And so, um, you know, given the sort of um, disease prevention um, benefits that are afforded by sexual modes of reproduction, um, because of the variability it generates, we became really interested in the idea that um, cues of changing levels of um, pathogens in the environment should influence people's mating strategies, especially if they sort of feel based on their own health history that, um, that they might be um, vulnerable to uh, pathogens and um, sort of their deleterious effects. And so we've got, we've done some work showing that um, women, um, that when they perceive that, that the pathogen load is relatively high, um, if they have a history of becoming ill frequently, that they desire a greater variety of partners. And, um, and we predicted that this would occur, and we've um, found this to be true in a series of um, several studies, um, because you know, it would help promote this idea of, it would help promote us a sexual bet hedging type of reproductive strategy where they're able to put their um, eggs in different baskets and um, hopefully one of those sort of genetic um, variants will hit. And so that's like one sort of piece of um, what we've been really um, kind of interested in in terms of the role that a person's health and immunological functioning and vulnerability plays in terms of um, shaping on mating strategies. And now we're sort of extending it to look at whether or not um, people's um, immune function, and we've actually been measuring doing different um, live challenges of, with their white blood cells. So we've been exposing their white blood cells to cancer cells and to um, E. coli and to some other types of um, stimuli and seeing um, how well they're able to effectively fight these things and see whether or not that taps into people's own, like whether their actual functioning of their immune system um, uh, is influences their perceptions of their health and expected longevity, and then whether or not these things play a role in terms of shaping their um, their mating strategies. And so we've got some um, some research looking at that, and then also have um, sort of similarly some research looking at um, immune functioning um, and signaling by the immune system and its role in shaping the desire for immediate versus um, later available resources. And so this research finds that if you, um, if your immune system is active and it's releasing um, th these signaling proteins are called cytokines, um, cytokines are really cool because they're, um, they help play a role in coordinating the body's immune response, um, both in response to pathogens, but also just in response to bodily injury, right? So as we age and our bodies start to kind of fall apart, um, cytokines are also on the scene and they're being released as the body is trying to repair itself and, you know, sort of keep itself alive. And so, um, and what's cool also about cytokines is that we know from a lot of research that they play an important role um, in directing the activities of the nervous system. So they're, they're able to actually directly influence what the brain does. And so they make a really nice um, uh, link, mechanistic link between the activities of the immune system and then what the brain does. And so we've been looking at whether signaling by the immune system, um, by the presence of these pro-inflammatory pro cytokines, um, will influence the desire for present versus immediate or present versus delayed rewards, um, predicting that when, um, you know, when the immune system is being stimulated and these cytokines are being released, that this should 
um, sort of lead people to uh, prefer more immediately available rewards compared to more distantly available rewards. And again, the idea here is that you know it makes good adaptive sense to desire more immediately available resources when your immune system is being stimulated, both because it implies a decreased probability of survival into the future, but also because your immediate resource needs are greater because your immune system actually requires a great deal of energy um, to be able to do all of its work. And so it sort of, you know, these two things predict um, present focused decision making. And we've got um, a series of studies now that have found this um, to be supported. And it's really exciting work because it also suggests um, ways of intervening in terms of leading to better types of decision making by, um, by folks who have a tendency toward inflammation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you finished your answer with, uh, with by talking about inflammation, and that's another topic we have to cover, but related to perhaps more metabolic diseases and the uh, probability of uh, developing them later in life while being exposed to some environmental cues during our development and things like that. But let's uh, just take a step back before that uh, and to and talk a little bit more about certain specific things that occur during our our development and particularly about the age of puberty onset so because I think that's a very interesting topic because the, uh, I, I've been listening and reading about this and there are people that for example refer to the fact that it seems to be a lot of evidence point, pointing toward uh, when people live in certain conditions like for example if they don't have enough familial familial support in this case they refer particularly to the fact that the parent might be absent and these affect these effects particularly the um, the age of puberty onset in girls and thing, and and perhaps other things like that and also access to material resources so uh, what are the things that people uh, uh, I, I, w I was going to say that people take into consideration, but they don't decide the age their puberty comes on, right? But what are the things, the environmental cues that influence the, their uh, age of puberty onset? Yeah, so there's been a lot of research, um, in particular with girls, um, as you noted. Um, looking at the effects of um, paternal involvement um, on pubertal timing. And um, this research is um, grounded in what's known as a paternal investment theory. Um, and it's sort of an offshoot of life history theory. It sort of uses those same, um, those same uh, sort of logic to make predictions about how girls should use the presence of dad in the home as a cue about their expected adult mating ecology. And so the idea is that if you're growing up in an environment where dad is around and investing, that sends a cue to girls that, oh, this is the type of, this is a high investment environment, right? And high investment environments are those that tend to facilitate slower life history strategies. So this is the delayed age of pubertal timing, heavy investment in a you know, smaller number of children. Um, whereas girls growing up in conditions where dad is not around and investing, that sends a cue to girls that, oh, this is a low investing environment. You know, um, this is, you know, something, this is the type of environment that favors earlier reproduction, the, the reproduction of a greater number of children and, um, and, the, and uh, less investment in each. And so the idea is that girls use the presence or, or absence of the father in the home and his sort of investment, um, because there's some research now that suggests that dad's um, sort of investing behaviors are really the sort of key that drives these effects. But growing up with a like an, a non-investing father sends this cue to girls that influences the t you know their um, sort of gonadal maturation um, and then pubertal timing. And there's been a great deal of evidence suggesting um, that girls who grow up in homes without investing fathers um, that they tend to go into puberty significantly earlier and they tend to have an earlier age of first reproduction. And both of these things are consistent with what we would expect um, if dads are providing a cue that this is sort of a fast you know, strategy type of an environment. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very interesting, and I don't want to question the evidence, but uh, in a sense, wouldn't it make sense that perhaps uh, a girl that is exposed to an environment where she expects to have uh, fewer resources and don't really have familial support through allo parenting and things like that, 
the, uh, wouldn't it make sense from an evolutionary perspective for her, her algorithms to compute that information in terms of uh, preferring a strategy where she would have less children because there's no uh, there's not enough resources to keep up a big family let's say right yeah yeah you know it's sort of like uh it's one of those things where it's like you can you can almost argue it from both sides right but the sort of the conventional evolutionary wisdom is that um, you know, that it, in these types of circumstances, um, it may make more sense to have sort of a greater number of children and invest relatively less in each, just hoping that one of them is going to somehow have the magic combination of traits that's going to be able to make it into the future with little investment. And so it's just this idea that um, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a like a bet hedging type of a strategy when you have a lot of children and invest relatively, um, relatively few resources um, in each. Mm -hmm. uh, and is this thing and the aspect of father uh, father absence uh, is it is it where it comes from where it comes the expression oh she has daddy issues yeah <laughs> yeah everybody it's so funny because like um that's always the thing people ask me when when I when I talk about this line of research and um like usually you know like when I'm talking with friends and so anyway it's funny that you ask the same thing yeah no and that and that's exactly it you know and it's it's like a really it's a um you know it's a, obviously not a um not a nice thing to say and I mean it's a stereotype but um, sometimes in stereotypes there is a kernel of truth and the, this kernel of truth is that you know that a lot of girls who end up exhibiting unrestricted sexual behavior do tend to have um, absent fathers and and you know and so that just sort of reflects a cultural expression um, which now I know transcends into Portuguese um, is, uh, is something that, um, yeah, is, is, is because of this conceptual linkage and it's like, we all sort of know it. Um, and this sort of explains what some of the reasoning behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So let's now finally move on to inflammation in early life and exposure to infection and the probability of developing uh, metabolic diseases later in life. So could you tell us about that? Yeah. So um, now, are you are you talking about my research, like looking at the influence of early life environments on eating behavior? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Perhaps also to link it with the development of diseases like diabetes and things right. like that. Right. 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 Yeah. So um, you know, I uh, we have research now in um, our lab that we've been looking at. Um, in several different populations, we've been looking at um, adults, and now we've even been looking at children um, as young as three years old, and we find that there's this really um, uh, sort of early developing impact of a person's environment on their eating behavior um, in adulthood and in ways that can influence inflammation and disease, the development of diseases like diabetes. So we find that um, growing up in conditions that are marked by, um, you know, that are characterized by low socioeconomic status and where um, caregiving is more unpredictable and they have a more unpredictable home environment, um, these types of environments um, already by age of three have had an impact on the development of um, energy regulation strategies. And when I say energy regulation strategies, I just mean, you know, what are the strategies like that people use for eating. And for most of us, our eating strategy, and this isn't something we ever think about, right? Most of us don't, well, some people do, like if they're on a, on a diet. Um, but I mean, most of us, like our eating strategy is, um, it's just like to maintain homeostasis. So when we're hungry, we eat, and then when we fill up, we stop eating. And, um, and as our energy needs, we eat, you know, our energy needs sort of guide our eating behavior. And, um, and you see this already in, in three-year-old children, children from middle-class homes, um, eat as a function of hunger, like how high their energy need is. And we've looked at this measuring blood glucose levels and um, reports from their parents on how long it's been since they've, since they've eaten. And already at age three, they're regulating that way. But kids from unpredictable homes, um, already at age three, we find that they're not eating based on their energy need. They eat based on food availability. And so there's something that goes on in their early environment 
um, that's in, that's leading them to eat even when they're not hungry. And, um, and this is again the type of um, a developmental switch that would promote survivability in an environment where caregivers are unreliable and unpredictable um, and access to resources may be relatively scarce. And so, um, you know, when you put that type of an adaptation, um, and again, we found evidence of this in college students. Now we found evidence of this in very young children. We find evidence of it in 12 year olds. We're finding it all over the place. Um, this is a type of developmental pattern that would promote um, a survival in, a, in an unpredictable or scarce environment historically. But currently, in our contemporary environment, um, poverty is no longer associated with uh, scarcity of resources. Instead, it's a you know it's associated with um, an abundance of low cal of like low quality, high calorie food items. And so, what happens is when you pair this adaptation. Um, you know, that guides this um, eating in the absence of hunger type of an effect in our contemporary, you know, poor environments, this can lead to the development of, um, yeah, problems with um, inflammation, which now we know is linked with um, uh, sort of present focus and impulsivity from our other research, but it's also, you know, associated with um, the risk for developing diabetes, um, uh, obesity, and it's related, you know, illnesses, um, insulin resistance, and so on and so forth. And so, um, yeah, this um, work suggests that, um, again, the early life environment plays an important role in the way that we develop and that this can have these really far-reaching um, impacts on health and then, you know, longevity, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very dramatic. And it's interesting when we talk about uh, poor people and their dietary choices, let's say, people tend to try to limit the analysis to the fact that perhaps uh, the, uh, the, sor the sorts of food they have access to and the ones that are cheaper, uh, the, that's the only reason why they choose those types of food, but, but perhaps with uh, by including these into the analysis there's there's an at least another factor there that is the that they get the environmental cues for uh, less resources and to lead them to a fast uh, life history in this case and that's perhaps another reason why they also choose those types of foods correct right yeah exactly exactly mm -hmm. yeah Okay, so let's get into another topic related to mating and reproduction. That is, uh, how do contraceptives influence women's mating strategies? Well, so this has been something... Um, so I actually just finished writing a book about um, the birth control pill and, um, and sort of the way that it influences um, women's brains and behavior and the world. And um, in terms of um, women's, you know, mating strategies, one thing that we know is that um, even though, um, you know, uh, contraception and, and the pill in particular is something that's sort of evolutionarily novel, right, and it's not um, something that, you know, we've evolved with, I mean, it's a product of our, like, nervous system. Like, we created this product um, as a means of sort of removing the consequences of sexual behavior from sex. Um, and one thing that we know from evolutionary psychology and all of the research that's been done in evolutionary psychology is that um, many of the sex differences that we see in uh, men's and women's mating strategies have to do with the sex differences and the consequences of sex. So for women, historically, the consequences have been, been very steep and, you know, because there's always this possibility of pregnancy. And because of this, um, women for a very long time were incredibly choosy about any partner that they might have because any partner that they might have, even if it's just a dating partner, if she's having sex with him, there's a chance that she could end up having a child. Um, but when you remove that as a possibility, um, women's sexual behavior becomes more like men's sexual behavior. And what we do find is that um, women, um, as the pills come on the scene, they become more sexually unrestricted. They tend to be less choosy about their short-term sexual partners, and they tend to have significantly greater number of them than they did um, in the past. Um, which is kind of interesting because it just goes to show you that our brain is very good at sort of calculating the fitness consequences of our behavior, even when that um, calculation includes, you know, information that's sort of evolutionarily novel, like the pill. What's really kind of neat about it is, um, 
just like to, we were talking about living in your mom's basement, you know, one thing that come, you know, another possibility that emerges from this is that given now that women are less discriminating about sort of the ambition and industriousness and all these other things of their sex partners, because now they can have casual sex without worrying about it leading to reproduction, is that um, men don't need to achieve as much as they used to in order to get laid. <laughs> so for men to have sex, now they don't need to have really achieved a whole lot because women are willing to have short-term sex. And in, in the context of short-term sex, women generally don't look at achievement. It's just like not part of the picture. And so men are able to achieve less and get more sexual access than ever. And I think that this is part of the sort of thing that's behind the fact that so many men are not going to college and living in their mom's basement and playing video games all day is because they can do all of these things and still get access to women. Whereas, you know, 50 years ago, before the pill was available to single women, this wasn't a possibility. Nobody would have sex with those men. But now women, because we are able to remove the consequences of our sexual behavior, um, we, you know, we're not as picky about that sort of thing. And so it's sort of changing. It might be changing women's sexual behavior. But in turn, because men's and women's uh, mating psychology and ambition all the, are so tightly tied in, it might be changing what men do and leading them to have less uh, motivation to achieve and to acquire resources than in the past, which is kind of a cool, I mean, you know, it's sad for men. And I've got a son and I worry about this sort of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, it's sort of, it's an interesting, just goes to show you how complex and um, uh, men's and women's sort of um, behaviors are and the way that they interact with one another. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a bit sad. And apart from that, you also have nowadays things like virtual reality porn. So you have 24 seven women available to wanting to have sex with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah, no, for sure. That's like the other sort of big piece of the puzzle. There's actually a really cool book out by this guy. Um, it's called Cheap Sex. And it talks about these issues. And it's like, it's a really fascinating read, like sort of in the sociology of the achievement gap. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I asked you mostly about women's mating strategies, but I also want to dig a bit more into men's mating strategies. Otherwise, since we're in 2018, I will be accused of sexism. So, <laughs> so, so I, I also posed this question to Dr. Buss when I had him on the show and also I think to Dr. Blesky Ricek. But do you think that perhaps nowadays and going back to the virtual reality porn and things like that, that because men uh, have immediate access to things like pornography and dating websites uh, and even sex robots, particularly in the more immediate future, um, that, that perhaps those things also uh, tweak their mating strategies into preferring perhaps more short-term mating strategies because I, I mean these things occur subconsciously and it might tweak their brains into considering that perhaps there's a much higher number of very beautiful women out there wanting to have sex with you all the time and they also have these very acrobatic sex performances and men also love <laughs> sexual varieties <laughs> So. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that you're absolutely right. I think that those things do sort of feed into, um, you know, men's perceptions of what's available. And then it like sort of the contrast effect has a negative impact on how they sort of view existing real life women. And there's been a lot of research, you know, like, um, like Doug Kenrick's work really early on in his career and other people looking at the effect of contrast effects and, and even looking at pictures of Playboy centerfold. And this was done like back in 1980s where there wasn't like so much, you know, there wasn't like all the porn and then the sex robots. And, um, and like when you put all of those things together, um, and then how men feel about, you know, regular women who like actually want a conversation and like maybe dinner and like, um, you know, it, I'm sure that there is like, um, yeah, that it's, that it has to feel like, well, why should I pay that price? Like, why should I, you know, when this woman isn't nearly as in, you know, sexually attractive as these, you know, people that are interested in me, right. Because I've been watching them on these you know, whatever porn websites. Um, and so I do think that, that it, um, that it does 
you know, sort of change what men's expectations are. And, you know, ultimately, um, you know, I think that that's part of the reason that we're seeing that, you know, in some places, like fewer people are having sex. I don't know if you've been reading some of this research that's coming out, but it's really, really crazy. Um, and I think, yeah, that that's part of it, right, is that it leads men to become sort of dissatisfied with what's actually available to them because their perceptions about what's possible have become skewed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, uh, and I mean, it, it's, a, it's a bit sad because I've already talked with this with some people not on the show, just informally, because I mean, with particularly with this thing uh, about sex robots and things like that, I mean, usually when we went to school in high school and things like that, people who haven't had sex would be bullied <laughs> and, <Yeah>. perhaps, <laughs> and, and, and perhaps that would bring some benefits to them. But nowadays, I mean, if, if it is to be considered losing your virginity just to stick your dick in an electronic thing, then the bullies no longer will be able to properly bully people. <laughs> because, because virtually everyone will be able to do it. So I, I mean, I, I'm worried. I'm wor- are, are, deep- you, are you worried about the? Are you worried about yeah. the future of bullies? Like they're going to be out of a job? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I mean, and I, and I mean, I, I think that bullies have to do their work, but do it properly. And yeah. with this complication, they they will no longer be able to know if that guy is really a virgin or not because. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean it, yeah. it, these these are very deeply complicated issues. That, that, that is, that's that's one of the deep that's one of the deep questions of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's for sure. That's for sure. Okay, <laughs> okay. So perhaps ju- just one last question. We've been yeah. talking about uh, how environmental cues might affect people, and particularly uh, poor people when they're exposed to a lack of resources and things like that. So, do you think that? Uh, this sort of research that you're doing and also other people are doing, uh, that the knowledge we can get from it might help us deal with some of the issues that derive from people's uh, selecting a slower or faster life history strategy that then might lead to bad consequences later in their lives. Yeah, absolutely. The thing that um, is really kind of cool about this research is that it's very predictive about the types of um, environmental circumstances that should influence different types of developmental outcomes. And uh, because of this, if we're able to identify what the sort of causal environmental factors are that impact a developmental pattern, um, we can change it if we don't like it. You know, so if we start to see that you know, this type of environmental set of circumstances will lead to, for example, delinquency or or aggression, right? We can try to change environments to try to change the contingencies um, that are impacting development in in ways that we like it. And with the stuff that we've been doing where we can look at um, like inflammation, like, you know, what's going on in the body um, in terms of um, promoting faster or slower life history strategies that also gives us a clear pathway for interventions aimed at improving health. And by improving health, we may end up improving um, decision making. And that's like a really um, sort of a powerful, you know, could be a really powerful lesson because it's like health based interventions are relatively less expensive and they're less um, changing environments is hard. You know, it's hard to like take kids out of tough neighborhoods and put them into safe neighborhoods. But if it turns out that some of this is going on because of dysregulation and things like um, immune based signaling, we can do things to improve health in those environments. um, And then, um, and then, uh, you know, potentially influence their decision making that way. Mm-hmm. Oh, but, but by the way, just to go back a little bit, because this just came to my mind uh, again about the thing about uh, men's brains being tweaked into preferring uh, short. <laughs> this is my dog and he's trying to get on the camera. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 
I thought I was going to be undisturbed by working from home, and then my dog comes and tries to sit in my lap. So sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, no problem, no problem. Let me just gather my thoughts again. Okay, so so I was going to ask you again about the things that we talked about porn, sex robots, and things like that, tweaking men's brains into preferring short-term mating strategies. Do you think that perhaps the feminists could have at least partially a point when they say that perhaps those things might change the way men deal with women and treat them, perhaps, uh, perhaps that then they treat them more like sex objects or something like that? Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that there's something to the idea that um, if, um, you know, men sort of, you know, like see women being treated as sex, ro sex robots, as they often are in, um, in porn and that sort of thing, or they're able to actually, you know, use these sex robots. Um, you know, I, I do think that that is going to change what men's expectations are about how much they need to invest. Because, you know, one thing that we know about uh, mating strategies and mating behavior is, um, you know, our environmental experiences play a really important role in terms of shaping, like, our expectations about, you know, what type of investment should I be able to garner from a partner? How much do I need to be able to invest in a partner in order to get sexual access? And if men are going and having sex with sex robots, which is no investment at all, it is going to change what men's expectations are in terms of their investment in women. And so I think that there's like there's absolutely something um, to that argument, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Hill, just before we go, would you like to tell people what are some of the best places on the internet for them to know a little bit more about your work? Right, sure. I thought you were going to say some good places on the internet to find uh, <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> So, um, so no, I know since I don't know anything about that. So, um, so to find stuff about my research, I have a website, um, and it's uh, sarahehill.com. So S A R A H E H I L L dot com, and then that's my lab's website, and it's got information about what we're what we're working on right now, and um, about the people who are working there, and uh, and some links to our recent our recent work. Okay, very well. I will be leaving that in the description box of the video. And by the way, really sorry about leading half of the conversation to sex, reproduction and mate strategies. But you know, I'm a man and at least half of my IQ is completely dedicated <laughs> to sex. So it's really yeah. difficult. <laughs> I understand. Yeah, no, it's great. No, I always enjoy. Um, I always enjoy talking about those topics. So it's fun. Okay, okay. So uh, again, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, and by the way, you just tell me, told me that you've written a book. So perhaps when it's out, we could have another conversation if you want. Yeah, no, that would be really great. Yeah, it's gonna be coming out next fall. So we'll be in touch. Okay, great. Okay, Thank great. Thank you so much. Hi everybody, thank you a lot for watching this interview until the end and also by the way for coming to my channel. Uh, as you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep this channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge. Any amount, even if just one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelina, Jim Frank, Francis Ford and Hans Frederick Sunda. Thank you for all.